Okay, starting again. I am Megan Bell of Margins Wine in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I work with lesser known vineyards, regions, and varietals that are on the margins. Uh, I don't do anything super obscure because it's, it's hard to get your hands on that fruit. Uh, because of, I'm sure people can guess um, who has the contracts to those fruit, and it is not young women winemakers. Um, but I do try to bring to light things that are just a little bit interesting that maybe people haven't had before, like 100% Cunois or uh, Chenin Blanc from Clarksburg in particular. A lot of people are familiar with these regions. Um, so I farm a two acre vineyard in the Santa Cruz mountains, and then I buy from nine or 10 other vineyards, depending on the year. And the vineyard that I farm has been certified organic since, uh, planting, which was in 2011. And it's actually on the site of the eighth registered organic farm in the entire U S. So DCOF, uh, the California state, um, organic certification agency was founded in Santa Cruz where I live. So these folks that co-own this vineyard property that I work on were already doing organic agriculture in the eighties. And some of them were the founders of CCOF. So they certified this, this parcel. Um, and then I work with other vineyards that are either not certified organic, but farming, practicing organic, or they are in the process of organic conversion, usually with my help slash insistence. Um, so I've done this with three or four uh, vineyards over the last five years. Um, I usually pick vineyards that have an interesting grape that I would like to work with but they're not farming organically, but they're usually close. And by close, I mean, maybe they're doing one or two practices that um, are not organic and there's no reason why they couldn't cut those out. Um, so I will provide guidance and then also assurance to the buyers that I am going to buy either their whole vineyard usually, or just what I say I'm going to sometimes for a higher price, uh, if they will commit to farming the way that I would like them to. And the reason I do that is because I'm starting to get frustrated talking to other people um, who are really dogmatic in natural wine saying like, organic or nothing, we only work with organic grapes. And um, I believe more in helping people see why they should be doing this so that we can see the increased organic vineyard acreage instead of just continuing to work with the same people that already agree with us um, over and over. So this year in 2021, uh, this coming vintage will be the first time that every vineyard I work with is practicing organic. So it feels like a huge accomplishment. That's 10 or I think 10 different vineyards. And that's never happened before. There's always been a new project that I've picked up to try to convince you know the growers that that they should go organic and really the way why they do it and and the way that I do it is because of our relationship together so it's not like I go into it like conniving like hey, I'm gonna get to know you so that you convert it's more just like you're good people I'm decent human like let's get to know each other let me share with you what I'm doing and not force it upon you, but let you decide if you would like to jump on this train with me over time. And there have been people in the past who have said like, you know, I don't think we're going in the right direction, only to call me back six months later um, and let me know that they are gonna convert to organics. And this has happened twice now. And when they, when they tell me they're not going to do it, I tell them that we're not going to work together anymore and express how disappointed I am because I've loved working with their grapes and the wine was fantastic, but there really has to be a wall, like a limit here. Otherwise you're not really as, as a winemaker doing what you say you're doing. If you're like, uh, I only work with organic vineyards, but this one, but this one, but this one, um, but they're working on it. They're in conversion. And I need a real time commitment from these, these folks to, feel like I'm doing the right thing in myself. So 
it's certainly not a flaky thing like I've seen some other people do where they really like the vineyard but they want to say that they're doing organic so they just call it in conversion this is really conversion and if it doesn't work out we stop working together um and that's really important to me um and then I of course make all the wine so far I am a one-person company um the company started in the beginning of 2016 so I'm about five and a half years in going into my sixth vintage in 2021. Um, I'll have my first ever employee who's a harvest intern for two months this year. And I'm really looking forward to that. But uh, in terms of winemaking, I do do all the grape trucking myself and all the winemaking myself. Um, so I am really uh, logistically oriented. So I'm not one to like play around with with the grapes and stuff like I I know what I'm trying to achieve in the wine and I will adjust what I'm doing over over time until I get there but once I get it I do the same thing every year and that's not because I'm trying to make the exact same wine it always ends up different every year because the factors of you know the year are different but I know the style I'm trying to achieve is best um, expressed through whatever techniques I'm using. So I destem all of my red wine. I don't do any whole cluster um, skin fermentation, meaning I do whole cluster press some of the white wines and um, the rosés, but I'm never going to have whole cluster in, in a red wine or a skin fermented white wine. Um, and that's that's because I, I like the I like juicy, bright flavors in wine. I'm really sensitive to bitterness and um, a whole bunch of other things that, that you can taste. And it's not like I'm only making wines that I like, but like I would like to, I would like to make wines that, that I really like because I found that even in our small natural winemaking community, while there is you know, more and more variants every year and more people making excellent wines. Um, exactly what I'm trying to achieve, I've only found in a couple of their producers. So I like really light, juicy reds. Um, <clears throat> they don't always turn out that way, of course, but I'm not going to uh, increase the likelihood that they're not going to turn out that way by throwing in whole cluster. Um, was that something that you learned, uh, you know, further back before you started uh, margins, or is that something that you've experimented dur during the first years of margins and then have moved away from in terms of the skin, you know, whole cluster? Yeah, I think I've been always been fairly anti whole cluster. Um, the earliest I remember being around it was in 2013 when I was doing an internship in the Willamette Valley making Pinot. And like, I'm not sure that I necessarily disliked it in wine yet. I don't think I could pull out that component yet when I was tasting. But um, when I was working, doing punch downs on whole cluster grapes is much harder than doing punch downs on uh, de-stemmed grapes. And that's certainly not why I do it now. But I think early on, I, I developed kind of an aversion to whole cluster of like, why why are we doing this logistically it doesn't make sense like it's making it take so much longer and it tastes worse to me so like wouldn't it be better for everyone if if we just de-stemmed it would be faster work and it will taste better uh, and then over time um when i when i learned tasted more and and learned more about what whole cluster wines taste like all of that was just confirmed for for me but so it wasn't necessarily related to the, the pH adjustment of the skins in contact with the juice. It was more of a flavor profile yeah. uh, reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I find that, you know, people ask me a lot like, oh, is this carbonic? And that's what I like about uh, de-stemmed reds. It's not carbonic. I also don't do any carbonic fermentation, but because the berries um, tend to stay, a lot of them tend to stay intact when once they've been destemmed. Um, it does do some carbonic, you know, in the bottom of the fermentation 
because it's that part's not really getting crushed uh, or mixed up because um, onto the next part of the red wine making, I don't do any pump overs. I only do um, punch downs. So I'm trying to do as little extraction in the red wines or the skin fermented whites as I can. Um, there's a small exception, which I'll say, since you guys have this wine, the 2019 Pinot Noir, I did do pump overs on that because the reduction was insane. Uh, and I had to do a lot of techniques to fix that wine without putting anything in it uh, <sighs> to make it even like remotely good a year ago. Um, now that's why that wine spent an extra year in barrel because uh, it really cleared up the reduction which, which in time is really our, our most valuable tool with wine making when we're not you know adding additives. Um, so, that one did get it had, a, it had a very like burgundian type of reduction that i yes. associate with 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 red burgundy and not with necessarily new world reduction right you know um that it had more of that kind of smoky spice note and let and not the eggy uh h2s note which was really cool because we could tell it's there it just was a, it was just more of a component of the aromatics and and not wow, this wine's reductive, you know? Thank you. Um, it was super eggy uh, when, it, when I was making it. And that's, you know, it was it felt risky at the time to play around with these techniques that I wouldn't normally do because I wasn't sure if the extra extraction and the extra air of pump overs was going to end up uh, being an improvement on that in the long run. And it definitely was, so. Uh, there's always exceptions, you know, but as, as a standard rule, these are the techniques that I like to employ. So um, all the reds just get, and the skin fermented whites just get one punch down per day. That's a super low extraction. Um, I'm not doing like a super vigorous punch down where I'm trying to like get the bottom of the grapes up to the top and like mix, mix, mix. I'm just trying to make sure the heat is kind of distributed a little bit and that the cap is wet um, so that I don't get VA problems. Um, so that's the red wines. They, they vary on how long they're on the skins. Um, Typically with Pinot Noir, I, I do it in a different style. So it would only be on the skins for two days and be kind of light. Uh, but that one, I the 2019 Pinot, I put onto fresh leaves from other fermentations several times to try to clear up the reduction um, and introduce that like healthy leaves and dead yeast population um, in hopes that it would turn out the way that it has. So, yay. Um, and then, so it's usually like two to 12 days on skins, depending on the wine. And then everything is aged in old neutral oak, French oak barrels, except for the Mouved, uh, which comes out in the fall. And that has some super neutral American oak. But in general, I have like 95% old neutral French oak barrels. And for me, you know, I'm not trying to get any characters from the wood, but um, it's simply a storage vessel because a, a old barrel is so much cheaper than stainless steel. <laughs> and, yeah, and oftentimes I notice that some, some producers will say, you know, neutral or used or older wood, but there's oftentimes an impression of the wood, it's still there. Uh, so when I tasted your wines, I, I kind of felt like they were truly very old. Wood. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so. you. Um, yeah, I really, really dislike the taste of oak in wine. So it was important to me to be sourcing the oldest, uh, barrels I could find like horrible condition. Like those are the ones that I want. Um, and I, I don't care about the, producer of the barrel meaning I mean of course it's history and um yeah I appreciate each barrel house the way that I would appreciate each winery but I'm not like oh like I need to source that brand of barrels and everything um I don't 
I've worked at many places like that and I've never felt like it was important even when I was working in that side of wine. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just storage. And then the white wines, um, the Chenin Blanc is just whole cluster pressed and neutral oak, that's it. Uh, I do stir that Chenin, just the, the Clarksburg non, non skin fermented Chenin gets stirred once a week throughout the winter. Um, Clarksburg, which is on the Sacramento River, about 10 miles south of Sacramento, uh, is a really hot area um, with super silty soils. And for whatever reason, the Shenan that comes out of there can be like really, really linear mineral, almost like concrete, one, one note. Um, and which I realized the first year I made that in 2016. So all the next, all the following years, I do incorporate badinage just to kick up the leaves uh, in the barrel, increase the weight of the mid palate and kind of bring out those more fruity characters um, so that there's, it's not so one dimensional. Um, the skin fermented Chenin is de-stemmed and on its skins for varying amounts of time, depending on the year. Um, in 2020, it was 25 days. So I will, when the fermentation is active, it will get one punch down a day. And then, um, I will just keep the cap wet with like a very gentle punch down with my hands, uh, once the fermentation is complete. And then when the cap fully sinks, that's when I press. And that skin fermented Shannon is from the exact same vineyard block as the direct press Shannon. So I think it's really fun to try right next to each other. Um, it's just picked two days apart because that's the soonest I can drive back to Santa Cruz, make, you know, the skin for, or make the direct to press wine, drive back to Clarksburg, pick the rest and then come back. Uh, it's four hours away. So it's quite a haul. Um, and then did you get the Muscat? No. No. Okay. Um, you know, so, so you, you can talk about that too if you like. Right. Okay, so I covered the three that you got, but so I only make one more white wine, which is uh, Muscat, uh, which I'm sure you'll get in the future as, as we continue working together. So that is um, half skin fermented and half direct to press, and that is just destemmed and on its skins for only two days, just to increase the aromatics since Muscat's you know smells so beautiful. But I don't want too much bitterness coming from uh from the skins um which can i feel like happen pretty easily in muscat like i would never leave it on the skins for 25 days like i would shannon um and then those are blended together right before bottling and the fermentations are they also in sort of uh oak you know with with the top off or are they in stainless or no, so as I said, I'm I'm super logistical, and I also don't think that this really affects anything. Uh, I I will not ferment in anything but stainless because it is a pain in the ass to ferment oak. It's so messy. You have you know it explodes. You have to clean the barrel. You have to clean the floor, which means you have to pull out the barrels again, um, and then you have to keep topping it up as the fermentation is completing. So I do all of my fermentations in stainless tanks. And then once it's done fermenting, I put it in barrel and then I can actually fill the barrel basically to the top so that I don't have to worry about keeping track of like which barrels are not topped and which got three quarter filled and got which got half filled. And all of that was really of necessity um, for the past five and a half years, just because I am alone and I think part of why I've been successful is because I have worked really methodically with things like this, instead of being like, hmm, let's see how this tastes fermenting in oak. I'm like, no, this ferments in stainless steel. It needs to go well. Like I don't have time to keep going back and doing it. Um, and also like I have worked at other wineries year round enough to know what did and did not work from being the person who was expected to be doing that work versus like my bosses at those other places being like we ferment in oak here and you're doing the work 
you know, but it's like, well, if you were doing the work, you probably wouldn't decide to do it this way because it doesn't make sense. And in the end, like, I don't think that the, the fermentation in the stainless steel tank for five days um, and then it going to Oak for another five months is really making a difference uh, in terms of people being like, I taste the stainless. Like, I do think it tastes the same as it would if it was fermented in, in the barrel. That's such a good point. Keep it simple. Yeah, I'm all very simple, streamlined. Yeah, um, what else can I cover? Um, Trini, would you have any? Uh... Oh yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your wine education and how um, your formal education related to your experience experiences with actually making wine and what kind of what you take from that or don't take from your education, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I studied winemaking at Davis right out of high school. So I was eight, I just turned 18 when I started the program. I didn't know anything about wine. I also didn't care about wine. Um, people are always like, well, why did you do it? And there was several reasons along the way because it was four years, but in the beginning, um, my high school boyfriend had just graduated college when I was starting college and we were really into brewing beer and we brewed pretty good beer. And he was from a wealthy family and was like, what if like my parents invest in us and we start a joint winery brewery? Like I'll do the beer and you just need to go to wine school to learn about wine. Uh, so that's why I went <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, which is so silly looking back for so many reasons, but you know, hindsight. Um, so the relationship didn't last that much longer uh, after I started college. Uh, so the joint winery brewery like wasn't going to happen. And then I had to keep coming up with reasons why I was doing this program, which was so hard for me. Um, I love literature and English and writing and I do have an English minor. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to study something that I was already good at. So it was really important to me to get a bachelor's of science because I've never been particularly great at science or math. And I, I have a chemistry degree essentially. And it was again, so difficult for me and only um, made harder by the fact that I had absolutely no context for how chemistry applied to wine because I had never worked in wine. I really wish I could go do that program again now because it would be so much more helpful to me. Um, so in terms of my formal education, like I don't remember a lot of it because I had no idea what people were talking about. And I wasn't super invested in like learning the prereq biochem and organic chemistry classes super well because I was like this doesn't apply to me why am I with pre-med students this is stupid you know I was um wasn't 21 until the last year of the program so <laughs> I just like <laughs> didn't know um yeah uh so so what I do remember and what applies to me now that that I'm grateful for that I know separates me not that it makes me better um, but certainly a different way of thinking of things from a lot of other natural winemakers who don't have this background is like, I remember microbiology and always like throughout harvest in my head, I like repeat to myself, like biofilm, 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 <laughs> which is really what I took away from the program is that every single surface is alive with a biofilm just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And if you don't clean that, that's going to mess up your stuff. Um, or if you want it to mess up your stuff, fine, you can choose that. But just be aware that just because it looks clean doesn't mean it doesn't have a biofilm on it. And even if you cleaned it, that film is still there. So that's like in the back of my mind pretty much the whole time, which is, yeah, what I, what I feel like I really took away from formal school and then most of what I learned was from working from for, for other people um, mainly from working in wineries the 
did use chemicals and were not natural wineries. Like I learned how to do things correctly. Like there's no correct way as we know now, but there, in terms of commercial winemaking, there is a, a standard procedures way to do it. And I learned all those things. I choose not to do a lot of them, but I know what I'm risking or what I'm gaining by not employing those things, um, which is really valuable now. Uh, instead of kind of being unsure of why I may or may not do something that way and experimenting. Like, like I said, I don't do a lot of experimenting because not that I don't have things left to learn, of course I do, but there are certain things that I, I know what the outcome is gonna be, so I don't do it that way. That's, that's great. That's a lot of stuff to take in. <laughs> and so how did you, like, what took you on the track of wanting to intentionally go in the kind of natural wine direction? So I, um, my first internship out of college was in Napa and I hated it. It was, so I lived in a co-op in college, basically a commune, and I've always leaned that way. Um, so getting into the formal wine industry, especially in Napa, was just so not my scene. Not only for the wine reasons, which I didn't even realize yet, because at that time, I didn't know what I liked at all when I came out of college. So we would like taste Cabernet you know, making $300 bottles and they'd be like, isn't this amazing? And I'd be like, mm, it's good. But in my head be like, I don't really like this, but like, I can't explain why. Um, but I guess like, this is what good wine tastes like. Um, but the issues I had with it were, were kind of twofold. One was that I remember when I finished that internship, my parents were like, so do you know how to make wine now? And I was like, no. <laughs> And that was the longest internship I've ever done. It was six months. But what my job was, was adding so many powdered substances to the wine. And I never knew what I was adding. There would just be like a jar left under a tank for me of powder. And then I had been trained how to mix that powder, whether or not it was in cold or hot water or wine, and then how to add it and incorporate it into the tank and then do the pump overs. And and that's your job when you're in like this wasn't even that big of a winery but once you get to a certain level of commercial wine making you're you do one thing you know i did pump overs for 12 hours and i hauled hoses up and down stairs and um there was no there was no relationship with the wine whatsoever like i was never tasting it i i was never the one measuring the sugars through fermentation. Like I really didn't know what was happening besides like what I had been trained to do. Um, and I- you were, yeah. powder, you were a powder specialist. <laughs> Powders and pump overs, yeah. And drain cleaning. Um, and then I, I worked with all men. There was only one other woman on the team. And I remember she was so I was 20, I just turned 22 and she was 28, which seemed so old at the time. And I, I said to her like, how do I get where you are? And she said, you don't want to be where I am. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, yeah, I still think about that. I know why she was miserable now, now that I've been in that position also over the years. Um, working for a bunch of really, really shitty men who just mistreat their entire team. And that's the culture. And that's, that's the standard. No one is going against that. There, there's absolutely no talk of social sustainability or like healthy, um, respectful environments. You're just the silly woman. And if you complain, like you shouldn't be so sensitive and if you complain again, you're just too sensitive and like, you need to get over it. And then everyone slowly, you know, exiles you basically. And that's what had happened to her. So she, um, yeah, I'm sure she hated her job and probably loved wine. Um, 
So after that, I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to keep working in Napa. And I don't think I want to keep making wine because this was so hard physically that the, and the payoff wasn't there with like the team atmosphere at all. Like the whole time I, I just felt so stupid asking questions. I had learned so much during that six months. Like I knew nothing when I started and I was truly an expert by the end. And no one ever said to me, like, your progress has been really wonderful. Like, it's great to have watched your professional growth. Like you have a whole career ahead of you. Like that would have been a wonderful thing to hear as a, as a young person, but instead, and I'm not sure whose quote this is, but it, it, I mentioned it a lot and it really rings true to me. It's that um, women are judged by their performance and men are judged by their potential. So even though I clearly had potential because I grew my skills so much in that six months because I started out knowing nothing that's how they saw me the entire time they were never able to see me change and grow whereas you know the men got and really they're the same some of them were the same age as me but they got more and more opportunities to like drive the forklift or you know learn new skills because um in in the supervisor's mind they're like well you're going to be working wine for a long time like you have a whole career ahead of you we need to give you some skills whereas when people saw me they're like you're just going to work in the lab you're just going to work in sales like you don't really need to learn this stuff and i think that's why so many women end up working in the lab in sales because uh no one wants to be treated shitty at work all day um which is why i almost left wine production to do the same thing but then I had the most amazing job in Oregon in 2013. I worked for Grant Coulter of 100 Sons Wine um, when he was still working at Beaufort. And it was a totally different work environment. He purposefully hired a majority of women uh, for interns and um, was kind and, and you know respectful. And um, when I started, they hired me without meeting me and I, I, for the whole summer, I was the biodynamics coordinator there with absolutely no experience. They just, one day, like on my first day, they're like, here's the ATV, here's the copper dynamizer, here's where we keep the treatments, go learn about it, read about it, and then come do it. And like, if you have questions, come to us, we're a resource, but like, you're in charge of this now. And, you know, people will really rise to some people, but lots of people will really rise to, to whatever um, skill set, you know, they need in order to improve if, if they're motivated. And that's the type of environment that I really needed to be in where someone could see that, that I wanted to be there and I wanted to learn. Um, and I always liked the wine work, but again, like it wasn't worth it to me to do that horrible work. <laughs> horrible if people were being horrible to each other and and me all day um so yeah had this great internship in Oregon Beaufort was um at the time I'm not sure what, what they're at now they have new ownership but they were all native fermentation there he was experimenting with some whole cluster and some carbonic um and adding really low sulfites uh I don't think they would say they're like natural wine, but it was the beginning of, of thinking about things like that for me. And Grant was, was into natural wine and, and he would bring bottles to share and recommend different places in California to, to check out. Um, and then after that, I kind of geared my own path in that direction of organic farming. I still worked at some wineries that were, were certainly not natural wine. Um, way more conventional but I had a better understanding of of what I was doing like after I finished my Belfair internship I was like oh this is how wine was made like wine making is so simple it was just made out to be so hard because uh these shitty men wanted to be on a pedestal and wanted to say like I know all these things and like and we're not sure if you're going to be able to learn them type of attitude is what my experience was and 
I'm, I'm sad that I started when I was so young because now I'd be like, no, like, I'm just going to learn this. And I think a lot of women do have that attitude, but for me, it was so disheartening, um, being that young and starting out that I felt like it was too hard and I was never really going to know, like only to find out that like winemaking is super simple. There's like a few things you need to know, and then really anyone can do it. Um, not necessarily meaning you're going to make the exact style of wine that you wanted to if you don't have a background, but you're going to be able to do it and you're just going to learn uh, the more experiences that you have. Um, so after that, I spent nine months in New Zealand um, working at four different wineries and vineyards. And that's where I like really learned how to work in the vineyard because I was vineyard crew. And then I went to France for three months and worked at in the Loire uh, making Shannon. And that's when I fell in love with Shannon and decided that I would want to start making Shannon in California if I ever got the chance. Uh, so in, in the Loire. So where, where did you work in the Loire? I, I worked at Piton Paille. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. It's funny because your wines really remind, do you know the uh, Domaine de la Pannerie? The one, Zev imports them. They have a peacock on the label. Oh, yes. Yeah, I your wines, I felt, were really reminiscent of those in terms of the texture and the, there's just a lightness to your Shannons that, I don't I think they're just so beautiful. So that's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I learned, I mean, I learned so much in the Loire. I, so I don't speak any French and I literally had no idea what was going on ever because everyone else was speaking French. Um, so the way that I learned there was way different than I've learned other places. Like, I don't know if, if any of you have spent time in a, in a place for an extended period where you don't speak the language, but what you think about is just different because you're, you notice how everyone moves and like that's how you get to know people um this is where my brain was at at the time i was i was observing how people smiled when they smiled how they moved their bodies instead of getting to know them by what they said and i feel like that type of thinking um like that's how i was learning wine there too like I didn't know why we were doing things or, and I didn't get to ask questions that I normally would. I was just like, that's going there and this is going there. And like, this is how long we leave this and it's touching air, interesting. I thought we couldn't touch air. Um, oh, and it goes into that underground tank but there's no drain in there. So that mm -hmm. never got cleaned. Oh, like I thought you had to clean things. And, um, but like you don't necessarily. So all of that, it was, it was a very visceral type of learning. Um, and, and I do think I, I am, have employed some type of instincts like that with, with the Shannon. So not necessarily taking specific techniques, but more instinctual. Yeah, just like I, Like one thing I always think of um, that is, it's a little embarrassing really, but so when, when we fill barrels in the new world, we look inside with a flashlight as we're filling and that's the only way to do it. But there, I remember <laughs> my boss was like, okay, fill the barrels. And I was like, where's the flashlight? And he's like, you do it by ear. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> what um yeah it just totally flipped your body is so much more involved and uh, like instincts like like that and and I think that is why like when I started pasting that wine originally from Clarksburg and was like oh like this isn't going in the direction I want it to like how can it be more like the Loire it wasn't that we did bad enough there, like we didn't, but I had seen all the punch-ins like lined up and I, I got to actually taste things there. So I knew what I was going for. Um, and it was kind of up to me to figure out the techniques to, to get there. 
so inspiring. <laughs> Elaine, yeah. would you would you would you would you like to uh, would you like to ask like any questions? I feel like you've covered so much in detail that I don't really have questions. Um, I'm really enjoying listening to you talk about your approach to winemaking, and it all just makes a lot of sense, which is really nice. So, the, I guess the one thing I was worrying wondering about is. Um, you're with your production growing in 2020 and sort of getting a little bit bigger going forward and having, you know, a harvest person come in to help you this year. Yeah. How has that changed your approach? Or do you feel like you dialed everything in so well in the cellar and throughout the year that um, in the cellar, it didn't really change. But also I'm wondering that same question about the vineyards and how has it changed in terms of managing those relationships or the work you do yourself, just that growth. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the winery techniques, it, it hasn't changed what I've already learned, but uh, part of the reason it's growing is because I'm making new wines every year. So I'm always learning what the best thing is, is for those new wines. Um, so I'll have, I'll think about it uh, around this time. I've, I, I don't go into it thinking like, what do I need to do on that? It just, this time of year, it just filters into the psyche of like, I need to start thinking about what I want to do with the new wine. Like, how am I going to make that? Uh, and then by the time harvest comes, I have a pretty good idea of how I want to do it. And then um, part of my logistics, I'm very calendar oriented. And like, once I decide I'm going to do something a certain day or a certain way, that's how I'm going to do it. I'm terribly inflexible, um, but it, it has worked for me. So um, that's why I what I decide to do. So probably in another month, I'll know like what I'm going to do with, with the new wines. And then uh, like doubling that production, um, it hasn't affected how I do things. It just makes things take longer. Like instead of stirring eight barrels, I now stir 15, uh, but it's fine, you know? And then when the next person, uh, well, when Lexi comes uh, for harvest, um, she's just going to be a second me, uh, w w which I'm thrilled about. And she's never worked in a winery before. And um, yeah, so she'll just be primed to, to learn exactly what I'm looking for. Um, and I'll explain why we're doing things, which, <laughs> which I didn't get. <laughs> it would be very helpful. Um, and then the vineyard. Um, so the vineyard is kind of an interesting scenario because it's so young. When I started working with it, we weren't at full vine production yet. The vines weren't old enough. So every year that I've been farming it with the owner, Larry, uh, we get more and more production. So I'm still learning. Like, I'm not sure what the optimal production level for, for this vineyard is. And like, for for now we don't drop any any fruit at all because we took typically crop solo in the santa cruz mountains anyway but like um the vineyard's doing like really really well and it's insanely vigorous and i'm like should we be leafing less should we be dropping more fruit like i'm not sure we just kind of do we play around every year like last year we we typically leaf really hardcore uh because we have super bad mildew problems because we're so close to the ocean um so we had like no leaves around the clusters at all and then we had this the crazy heat wave and we lost like half the crop of merlot which was not even ripe yet uh it was still green and all of those berries just deflated like balloons and we had to drop all of that so this year we have like a lot more leaf cover that we've left but like it remains to be seen if that's gonna make our mildew problems miserable. Um, but yeah, so far it's just, it's just me and Larry. Um, I brought in a lot of volunteers this year to, to help just because every year I get busier. So it really is a, a good question. Like where do I see myself going forward? But um, what I see is bringing on more employees to do the stuff that I don't really want to be doing, like the computer and everything. And then I'll just be in the vineyard <laughs> continuing to do the, the labor because I love it. Um, 
I've really tried to set up my life so that I can be in the vineyard as much as, as I want to be. Um, so like when other people are like, okay, I'm getting things done so that I can have a vacation. I'm like, I'm getting things done so that I get to be in the vineyard that whole week. Um, but like, of course I am going backpacking tomorrow, but, uh, part of getting to go on that was doing the last five days in, in the vineyard and getting those things done. But, um, yeah, I don't, because I have Larry as my co-person, the vineyard isn't stressful for me the way it is for other winemakers my age who are um, sole employees and also growing grapes and making wine. For them, the vineyard, at least in Santa Cruz, it's like, ah, we have to spray, we have to leaf. Um, uh, we had to shoot then and we missed it. And now we have pottery mildew and it's stressful and you have to get out there. But like, should you be getting out there when you're supposed to be prepping for bottling and you know, you're pulled in all these different directions. But um, if I can't get out there, Larry's there. And that's the beauty of working in teams. And like, I don't, I don't take, like, I, I'm proud of myself for what I've accomplished by myself, but I'm certainly not like, I must do it alone forever. It's certainly, it's just been out of financial necessity. I can't wait to have another person on my team full time. So what what's the elevation of your vineyards? Oh, they vary a lot. Like the lowest one is like five feet. <laughs> um, I think that's Clarksburg. And then the highest is probably Zianti Vineyard. So it's in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And it's, I think it's at like 1,800 feet. So they're really, some of them are alpine wines that really count as that classification. Alpine wines? Mm -hmm. Like alpine gra grapes grown at, I mean, is it like 1,200 feet? Higher, we kind of think. Would, is, I don't know. I yeah, I mean, there, there's in Oregon. There's like this, you know, this kind of higher altitude area, the Columbia Gorge, that I think many winemakers refer to the the climate as more alpine style um, production. So, mm -hmm. but you you get more. Basically, you're getting more. You're getting more acidity and just freshness in those higher the higher vineyard in the in that area that you're using. They're different style is that is that kind of you know are, do, you, do you find them to be a different quite significantly different in flavor profile not really okay. um like the clarksburg shenons are are so acidic um <laughs> and they're grown in one of the warmest areas of california um so they're grown near the delta so really really low elevation basically at at sea level um on on these rivers um that so in clarksburg all the vineyards are islands and they would be underwater if the levees weren't there so all the roads are on levees and you drive around on the levees and then all the vineyards are like 15 feet below you <laughs> um so the soil they're planted on used to be underwater you know, for millennia. And um, because the area is surrounded by water, there's a breeze at night that comes off of the water and it does cool down. So it's probably like 95 degrees minimum there every day in the summer, but it's still 55 at night, even in, you know, the, the height of picking season when it's super warm. So that retains acidity. Like I'm picking there at, um, around 19 or 20 bricks and the pH is like 2.9. Wow. Um, wow. The, the lowest, uh, the highest acidity grape I work with happens to be at elevation, but it, it's also Barbera. <laughs> um, so Barbera is just like super acidic no matter where it's grown. And I think that came in at like 2.95 um, and 23 bricks or something. So uh, yeah, I just, I try to, I try to just pick earlier to keep that pH low and retain acidity. Of course, there are times that it doesn't work out. Like 2020 happened to be a really high pH year in the red wines, pretty much everywhere. Um, but with the white wines, I am 
paying closer attention to pH than I am with the reds. Thanks so much for all of this. I think I think we covered a, you know, we're really inspired by by you and your project, and even more now having heard you tell the story. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope we can do this again. Uh, you know, with our with our team and also uh, you know in person too. So, so yeah, definitely in person. Awesome. I've I've been to the Columbia Gorge, but I've never been to like actual Washington. The gorge is really uh, it's a special place and it's like there there is such east to west there are just really such uh, diverse uh, terrain you go from uh, like we were talking about this kind of alpine more alpine style uh, vegetation to to desert in not many miles so mm -hmm. um, hopefully yeah. you come up and visit and uh check it out it is it is very much very different than a lot of washington so cool but meanwhile i hope you have a great backpacking trip thank you and oh. um thank you so much for fitting me in at short notice uh, and for being on email at midnight not everyone is on email at midnight i appreciate that <laughs> We were able to, to plan it. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, whenever, we'll meet you wherever you're at. So thank you. Yeah. Um, is there anything? anything no, else? I think we've covered it. Thanks. So what we'll do is we'll save the conversation. We'll have it up on YouTube, share it with our team, and then we'll start taking the wines out next week. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, so I we'll be wait. in touch to give you a response. Um, but in the meantime, have a nice trip and thank you. And we look forward to having you visit whenever you're ready. You're always welcome to come. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. 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 Thank you.